This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating for us in iTunes. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. This UCTV podcast is sponsored in part by Audible.com, your destination for the widest selection of digital audiobooks available, including many by guests you've seen on UCTV. Audible.com is offering UCTV viewers a free 30 day trial subscription and one free audiobook download. Just visit audibletrial.com slash UCTV to sign up. And thanks. We're actually going to have uh, Dr. Stephanie Greer, who is a PhD candidate from Dr. Uh, Matt Walker's lab here in the sleep of uh, uh, the laboratory of sleep and neuroimaging, and she is going to present uh, on. She's interested in reward processing and decision making, and uh, including food decisions, and using human neuroimaging techniques. Dr. Greer. you about uh, what the sleep-deprived brain wants to eat. So uh, going back to the introduction to this uh, symposium today, uh, we know that sleep loss is correlated with obesity. And uh, assuming that one potential reason for this is that sleep loss causes obesity, uh, we'd all like to know how this works on the level of the individual. Now we also heard um, a, a plethora of, of really um, amazing work about how uh, uh, sleep loss affects the body and how this plays a role. Um, but what I would like to talk about is how the brain might play a role also. Perhaps the most uh, interesting thing that the brain does in this context is to make food choices. For example, uh, when you see a donut, you have to decide, uh, do I want to eat that donut? Now when I see a donut, I think, man, that donut looks delicious. But, you know, maybe I also think it's not very healthy. Although, you know, I'm pretty hungry. Maybe, you know, I didn't have any dessert with lunch. So there might be other factors to consider. In other words, we make a food choice. We take a variety of factors uh, into account. We have to come up with a way to combine them all or evaluate them all together and decide ultimately whether we're going to eat the donut or not eat the donut. So uh, if we think about this decision in the context of sleep loss, and considering that um, one of the things that may happen under sleep loss is that we make poor food choices, we might then want to know what are the neural consequences of sleep loss that could lead to these poor food choices. And we had uh, two hypotheses in particular. So if we consider the brain, um, and here I'm showing a coronal section, so slicing, sorry, through, through sort of ear to ear. Um, and uh, now I'll circle, uh, classic uh, reward region known as the ventral striatum, uh, we might hypothesize that this basic dopaminergic reward region would be overactive under sleep deprivation, because that's been shown in other decision contexts. And if it were overactive, then we might expect uh, there to be an emphasis on the uh, hedonic qualities of food. Um, and activation in the ventral striatum to food has been shown to uh, increase eating or, or um, uh, uh, drive sort of overeating behaviors. So that's one hypothesis that we might consider. But there's another hypothesis that we also have, which is that areas higher up in the frontal lobe that are involved in evaluating or integrating signals might be less active under sleep deprivation. And here I'm highlighting the anterior insula, the anterior cingulate, and the lateral orbital frontal cortex, because these areas of the brain have been shown to be uh, involved in evaluating and integrating signals across a variety of stimuli, and also specifically food, food uh, stimuli. So they're involved in integrating food features, and also uh, when you're asked to regulate your food choices, uh, these areas uh, come up also. So if these areas were decreased under sleep deprivation, people might find it difficult to uh, take into account all of these appropriate factors. 
And you might uh, redistribute the weight of these factors in some way and, and come up with uh, worse food choices. So, so this is our second hypothesis. And so we conducted a study to distinguish between these two. And what we did is uh, we had 23 participants. Uh, they were all uh, healthy uh, young adults um, with no history of uh, neurological or psychiatric disorders and no food restrictions or allergies. Um, they also kept a regular sleep schedule and abstained from drugs, alcohol, and caffeine for three nights before and including our study. And uh, in our study, they partook in two sessions, one where they had a nine-hour sleep opportunity in the lab and one where they had a night of total sleep deprivation. And both of these were monitored in the lab. Um, in the morning, they partook in an MRI scan, so where we could monitor brain activity. And just to note, um, an hour before the scan, they were given a small breakfast in both sessions. And in the sleep deprived session, they were given a snack at 2.30 a.m. And this eating schedule um, seemed to make it so that when we asked them how hungry they were around the scan session, uh, there were no differences between the two groups. So we don't think our, our brain activation is related to uh, hunger differences. And uh, this uh, study was counterbalanced across subjects for repeated measures crossover design. So now focusing on the MRI session, what did they actually do in this task? Uh, well, we asked them to uh, first look at a food item and then tell us how much do you want that food item right now. And then finally, they just waited for the next trial. And they rated these items on a scale from one, strongly do not want, to four, strongly want. They saw uh, 80 food items total, and they were from a variety of different uh, categories um, and calorie contents. Um, and then also, after the scan, they were actually given one of these items based off their rating so that we could um, really ask them to concentrate on what they wanted to eat right now. And so, as I was saying, using these ratings together with our uh, 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 neural measures um, from the MRI scan, we asked what areas of the brain increase their activity with increasing uh, desire for the food. So what this is telling us is, is we're really asking what areas of the brain are discriminating between foods that you're going to want and choose to eat and, and uh, foods that you're, you're not going to want and not choose to eat. So, so we think of these brain areas as driving that food decision. And we use this metric to test our two hypotheses to see if the reward system was driving this decision more or if the evaluation centers were, were less active or, or driving this decision less than they normally would be. So if we move on to the data, uh, what we found was when we looked in the reward center, specifically the ventral striatum, um, because this is such a, a classic area here, um, and if we are sort of plotting uh, brain activity or the, the amount that the brain is correlated with how much you want the food, um, we saw no differences actually in this basic reward area. Um, we looked in a couple other areas that you might uh, consider also to be basic reward areas and didn't see any differences there. But when we look up in the frontal lobe in our evaluation areas, and starting with the anterior insula, we saw a significant difference between the sleep deprived and rested conditions, such that the sleep deprived participants were not uh, activating or recruiting uh, these brain areas in their decision to the extent that they were when they were rested. Uh, we saw a similar profile in the anterior cingulate, as well as the left lateral orbital frontal cortex. So what we're seeing is, is uh, overall, no differences in these basic reward areas, but a decrease in these areas that we consider uh, to be evaluating or in integrating information. Um, so we wanted to know also, you know, these are interesting brain differences, but uh, how is this going to translate into people's real food choices and, and their behavior? So the first uh, behavioral metric that we looked at, um, in addition to the ratings that we took in the scan, we also asked them to uh, rate these foods after the scan specifically on how healthy the food items were and how tasty these food items were. And then we could ask the question, how well does how healthy you think something is predict how much you're going to want it, and how well does how tasty something is predict how much you're going to want it? And for each individual subject, we looked at um, whether health could significantly predict those choices or not, and then also whether uh, taste significantly predicted those choices or not. Um, and this might be considered uh, a way to test how much you're integrating these factors of health and taste into your, into your decisions behaviorally. 
So using this metric, um, I'm going to plot here the percentage of subjects who had a significant predictor of, of health using a linear regression analysis. So this is um, uh, basically showing how many people are taking health into account. And what we're seeing is a significant decrease in the proportion of subjects taking health into account uh, when they're sleep deprived compared to rested levels. Um, so here we have almost 50% of people taking health into account when they're rested, dropping to about 17% when they're sleep deprived. And we actually see a similar trend in taste um, that isn't as uh, dramatic. Um, and uh, so we're, we're seeing both um, a, a decrease in how um, and how much people are taking health and taste into account. And then to further explore um, these food choices and say, okay, well, what does it really mean to not take health into account or what does it really mean to not be evaluating these processes? We also looked at the foods split by low calorie uh, foods and high calorie foods. Um, and uh, here we looked at the percentage in each of these categories of foods that were wanted by the subjects. So. Um, for, for um, this case, we found no difference in uh, the percentage of low calorie foods that people wanted, but a significant increase in the percentage of high calorie foods that, that people wanted. So people are shifting um, their decisions over to wanting more of, of this high calorie category, which is consistent with the evidence that we, that we saw um, before where people are, are actually making um, uh, their uh, food choices in other contexts. Um, so in conclusion, uh, when we consider um, how the brain considers a food choice when it's sleep deprived, we found no differences in basic reward areas, but we did find a significant decrease in frontal areas that are involved in evaluating or integrating information after sleep loss. We also found that this was associated with a behavioral profile where you were taking taste and health into account less than your decisions, and particularly health, um, not quite as, as significantly taste. Um, and this was also associated with choosing a higher proportion of high calorie foods. Uh, so um, overall, um, as we heard before, there's um, definitely some um, really important effects going on um, in the body when people are sleep deprived. Um, but now we think there's also a role that the brain is playing um, in this context. And an interesting thing to uh, think about for future research is how these systems might be actively uh, interacting with each other as signals uh, go up from the body to the brain and back down from the brain to the body as, as we know is happening. And understanding this full system will help us get a bigger picture on how uh, sleep loss is connected to obesity. So thank you all so much for your attention and thank you to the Walker Lab and our uh, research team. I mean, in, in terms of our ability to predict based on health and taste, it does it appear to be more arbitrary. You know, we're less able to predict it. Um, I think that um, what this really represents is, is kind of a, a, a food stimulus in this case, but maybe other stimuli in other cases going from kind of a complex 
item with lots of uh, facets and health and taste and texture and whatever to kind of being more of like a, a flattened uh, stimulus. They might be concentrating on one aspect or another. And um, my guess would be that um, familiarity might play a bigger role um, in your food choices in this kind of flattened context, but I don't have any data on that. I don't know what they were, you know, used to eating or uh, what they were in the habit of eating. Yeah, yeah, so thanks. Hi, I'm Jimmy Gillard from the Center for Health. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. I just was very curious um, if you did any baseline testing at all for um, evaluation, ability to evaluate before, just so you were sure that the, the 12 that you randomly selected had um, similar, you know, ability to evaluation to begin with, and, or what um, other plans you have to do that? Um, well, uh, so we're, we're comparing uh, within subjects in this case. So, so they all complete both the rested and the deprived uh, session. So they are, are compared to sort of their own evaluation um, abilities in that sense. Um, so we don't have any baseline measures of that, but I think that since we're looking within people, um, that that would account for that kind of processing difference. 